Hi, everyone. This is Joe. This last Saturday, James and I sat down and recorded this episode. The result is that this went on for a very long time. And rather than put out a long episode, I'm going to split this one in two parts. So this is part one. And next week, we will have part two. Thanks for listening. Let's get started. This is the Decahedron Podcast with Joe and James, two old dudes talking about RPG stuff. Hi, James. Hi, Joe. How, How was your that? week? <laughs> well, what did you say? I talked over you. I was saying, how was your week going? All right. Well, we'll start with my week. My week was, um, oh, there's a little stress. My uh, my mother-in-law is having some cancer surgery on uh, Wednesday. So, uh, yeah, there's stress all about the house about that. And uh, this was my 12-day work week where I worked every day last week. And then I worked my other job this weekend and then worked every day this week on my primary job again. So there was that. Although last Saturday for my my second job, we had our annual holiday party and it was a black tie event. So I got to get all dudded up and uh, the missus got into her gown and it was a wonderful night. So that, that was probably the high point of my week there. How about your week? Compared to yours, mine sounds very slow. Work, sleep, eat lately, and some classes, but nothing really excited. Uh, had to do a short trip, only a couple of days. Came back from that, ready for another vacation. So, <laughs> slow. So, um, what are we talking about this week? Um, we're going to talk about you, but... We're going to talk about me. Oh, my yeah. favorite topic in the universe. Yeah, I, I usually like the old expression... Revenge is a dish served best cold, but waiting a year to do it, this probably would not go well for the podcast. I uh, I didn't know you were a Klingon. <laughs> oh, not a Klingon, just a realitist. It's it's more fun to make the person t- entirely forget about the situation. All of a sudden, oh, sh- what is he doing? <laughs> I think it would have been hard to sneak up on me, though, because I'm the one that usually controls when we're when we are recording. <laughs> well, and the other issue is it has to be when you entirely forgot about it. So <laughs> that ain't going to happen anytime soon. No, so let's, let's get to it. Now, I'm going to start off with some easy questions and try to get you to expand on part of the question we left off on mine. Tell our people about the books you like to read and why we cut the discussion off last time with how you pick your books. So currently I am reading nonfiction stuff. I'm still finishing up uh, John Peterson's book about the origin of TSR hobbies, Dave and Gary, and you know how they get together, how they started the company, how they consider Dungeons Dragons to be a $300 idea, that kind of stuff. Before that was John Peterson's massive tome, Playing at the World. It's like a thousand pages about the, the origin of role-playing games from war games, etc. So that's for like stuff that I buy to read. The other stuff that you're probably talking about is I am a big fan of fantasy and science fiction, but historically, actually, I guess it kind of ties in. Mm, never thought about that. Like I'm reading about the origins of our gaming hobby. I like reading about the origins of modern science fiction and fantasy, but not from an outsider perspective, but by going in and reading those old books. And a lot of them are in the public domain, so I can get them straight off of gutenberg.org. And you go in, you know, find them, and I load them onto my Kindle, and it's very easy reading. And so, like, the very first Buck Rogers stories, and you can get there, and you can read it, and you can can see it. There was this, another series, Tom Corbett Space Cadet. Apparently, it was a 1950s television show that I don't think exists anymore because I think it was all, like, live transmission back in the day. It was before video. And but they made a series of, of novelizations, and it's interesting to read those. One, one, the stories are, are okay. Two, it's interesting to see their take on the future in space travel. 
and three it's just interesting to see what their stories tell you about the culture at the time they were written for example at one point Tom Corbett has the job of interviewing colonists for Mars or some planet where they're going to set up a colony. I don't remember the exact planet. And so when he's doing the interviews, he's making sure like uh, the men are good engineers and are good at construction and the women, he has to make sure they can cook, (laughs) which is a little uh, sexist. Oh, it's more than a, a little sexist. But yeah, it's, it's just interesting what that says about that day and time. So there you go. There's there's what I read and why. I'm going to jump to one of my other questions. What do you collect? I have recently moved. I've gone through this this decluttering phase in my life, or at least I'm trying to. And so I'm trying not to collect. I do have a, a few things, RPGs, although not like I used to. I used to just try to grab anything that was an RPG. Now I do have specific things. I mentioned before I have Liz Danforth's personal copy of Tunnels and Trolls 4th Edition. I have a, uh, I think it's a third printing of original Dungeons and Dragons in, you know, the the white box with the three booklets inside. Mm -hmm. And because it's kind of fragile and old and it costs a little bit of money, I don't like to actually open the box and go through the books. And so a few years ago, Wizards of the Coast had a classic reprint and it came in a wooden box and they reprinted the little books and they threw them in there. And I think they also threw in uh, Greyhawk and Blackmore and these demigods and heroes, I think. Anyway, they're all in this really nice box and it came with dice and everything. And it's all in, uh, you know, came shrink wrapping everything. And I bought a copy of that, my friendly local gaming shop. And I said, great, now when I want to go through books, I can just open this one because this is a reprint and nobody will care. And I put it to the side and I forgot about it for a little bit. And then uh, one day I was looking it up to show somebody what it was like on Amazon. And the prices for that are now more expensive than my original third printing of Dungeons and Dragons. So now I feel like I can't open up that. (laughs) (laughs) And uh, so I'm still in, in quest of like a physical copy of the original rules that I can like just flip through without feeling like I'm destroying history. So anyway, uh, I have that big eyes, small mouth. I have first through third editions in hard copy, but from a collector's point of view, that's it for collecting. The other thing I collect is vintage 8-bit computers. I have a, well, actually I say 8-bit, but I'm trying to expand to 16-bit. So I have an original Commodore 64. I have an Atari 130XE. I am searching for a TI-99 for a... (laughs) If I would come across a Coleco Atom, I would think about it. And to go into 16-bits, I'd like to get my hand on a uh, a classic Amiga and Atari ST. Uh, So those are the, the two things I collect these days. Oh, the other one I would probably grab is a Trash 80 Coco <laughs> color computer. But anyway, enough of that. What's next, sir? <laughs> okay. What was some of your greatest adventures that you have done in life? A while ago, I figured out that this thing I do is actually called adventure travel because I never thought of, of it that way. I thought of it as just like these cool things I like to do. So yeah, I'm going to say adventure travel. And I'll give you some examples. So this year... Back in August, I think I talked about it at the time, my wife and I, we went to Hawaii and we spent a week on Oahu, which is where like uh, Honolulu and Waikiki is. Yeah, yeah. But actually, I was going to say, but you know, that's just Waikiki. But actually, while we were there, we we went into a shark cage. We went snor- snorkeling with uh, the giant sea turtles. Did we do anything else adventure there? Uh, we did zip lining. I don't consider that adventure now because I've done it so much. It's just something we do. Uh, but yeah, we did zip lining. So that was on that island. But then the second week, we went to the the big island of of Hawaii, and we actually stayed on the rim of uh, the the Kilauea volcano, uh, which is actively erupting. It's not the one that's been hitting the news in the last week or two. That's that's Mauna Loa. They're they're like sisters. They they sit next to each other. So the place where we stayed was a cabin that I could walk to the rim of the erupting volcano. It would take maybe a five minute walk. And so at night we would go out to to look at the lava, which was amazingly cool. Like I said, we stayed there for a week, did a helicopter tour over the the crater, 
uh, so the lava that way and stuff like that. So that was this year. Uh, last year, uh, we went to Alaska. Again, more supplying. Uh, Den- Denali National Park. We saw, oh, took a seaplane out to, um, I don't know, somewhere way out in the, the backwoods. And from there, we took uh, boats to watch the bears uh, feeding on the fish. Uh, my wife has a great video of a bear just coming out of the woods, snagging a fish uh, in, its, in its claws and walking off. We took a helicopter up to the glacier and we drove a team of sleigh dogs. Uh, yeah, snow dogs. Uh, yes, sled dogs. We, what else did we do? You're, you're, oh, we went uh, whitewater rafting in, in Alaska down. Uh, and while we were there, there was a baby moose that jumped into the, the river and was like trying to get into the raft. And we had to paddle away ferociously to get away from it because where baby is mama has to be somewhere and moose are huge um (laughs) so that that was last year uh the year before that that was like peak covid so we didn't get to do anything i don't know then i went uh open water kayaking in vancouver north north vancouver island with the orca so you're just paddling along in the the orca orca yeah i cannot talk today the orca killer whales are on either side of you as you're paddling along. So that was pretty awesome and intense. Uh, oh, whale watching cruises. I consider that a nothing because we do that like every couple of years. I drive down to Pennsylvania to, to Elk County to watch the elk during rutting season. I love it when they, they lock their antlers together. So I like I like wildlife foot photography. So that's always great to go down and do that. In 2016, wow, was it that long ago? That's like six years ago. It's about another... We did the, the Camino de Santiago, which is a little bit of a walk. And well, I say Spain, we, we actually started in France and uh, we walked over the, the Pyrenees into Spain and then uh, across to the town of well, the city of, uh, of Santiago de Compostela. It's about a 500 mile walk and it took us about a month. And it's a route that people have been walking for like a thousand years. So, like when we get to Pamplona, there was a place there called the Trinidad de Ors. Actually, probably Ares, right? Because it's uh, Spanish. It's this building that that hosts people that do this walk, Pellegrinos. There was a sign on it that says it's been doing this for like 900 years. This very building that we stayed in has been hosting people doing this walk that we're doing for 900 years. That just blows my mind. Yeah. And so the whole thing, of course, when you're walking for 30 days, just one foot in front of me, the other for 500 miles day after day, you you have a lot of time to think. And it just, it made me think a lot about how I deal with travel in gaming. Uh, but that's a whole nother story entirely. Next question, sir. Okay. I know you don't play a character very often, but what is your favorite character to play and in what genre? <sighs> I don't think I have a favorite character to play. I talked before about the favorite character I ever made, which was my shapeshifter in Gamma World, but... I was referring more to class than um, character. I I think what I'm going to say is, if you would sit me down any given day and nine times out of ten, I think I would like to be uh, the captain of a big spaceship type thing. I want to be Kirk. I don't want to be Picard. I want to be Kirk. Although, you know, you could convince me to be a fighter pilot in like a uh, Battlestar or something. But yeah, so something along those lines. That 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 is what I would like to be. Okay. And see, we are usually doing D&D based conversations. What is the class that you dislike the most? Oh, out of all of the version paladin. Mm-hmm. Oh, I was guessing that anyways after a <laughs> question we had. <laughs> What is your favorite movie other than Princess Bride? My favorite movies are probably A Tree Grows in Brooklyn, which is set around the turn of the century in uh, New York City. Well, in Brooklyn, the title gives it away, within like an Irish immigrant family and the issues that they are facing. Absolutely adore that movie. Another movie I absolutely adore is called Captain's Courageous, which is the only movie that Spencer Tracy ever got an Oscar for. So Spencer Tracy's in it. Uh, Lionel Barrymore's in it, uh, who most people know as the old guy in a wheelchair in A Wonderful Life. But Mm -hmm. he's a much more dynamic actor than that. He has a wonderful role in Captain's Courageous. The movie is about the broken relationship between a boy and his father and a, a surrogate, we'll call it for lack of better term. And 
the journey from boyhood to manhood. And it deals with a Portuguese immigrant, which which has some resonance for, for my family background. Oh, and it takes place in like New, New Bedford in Gloucester, uh, which is pretty close to where I grew up. And in fact, uh, it ends with a shot of the Gloucester Fisherman's Memorial. And if you ever go there, it's the big statue with a fisherman holding a ship's wheel and everything. You see and the Groton fish sticks package. But anyway, <laughs> uh, if you ever go there, there's a big plaque all around it where it has the names of fishermen who were lost at sea. And if you look there, you will see uh, some members from my uh, family in the past. Uh, oh, but uh, other movies, of course, Princess Bride, maybe because it's Christmas time, I'm going to say this one, but I really do like it. A lot of people don't like it or it's it's fashionable to rag on it. I don't know. But I think Love Actually is a really good movie. Just all the disparate different aspects of love that it presents, familiar love, betrayed love, forbidden love, impossible love. It's it's a great movie and I adore it. Like I said, I might be the only one that says that. I don't care. I like it. Love actually. Oh, um, The Best Years of Our Lives. I might consider that a war movie. It's about uh, right after World War II, a bunch of uh, soldiers, sailors, all that coming back from the war and how they're adjusting to the after war experience where they were somebody and they were important and now they're not or vice versa. And it, it's a great little look at that adjustment and that, yeah, that, that, what it does to, to your, to your head. Um, oh, my best screwball comedy is uh, Barbara Streisand, Ryan O'Neill and <laughs> What's Up Doc. Excellent movie. Uh, so let's go on to something else. Uh, what are your favorite dice or what, uh, D, whatever, do you like? It's the D12. There is absolutely no question about that. It is my favorite die. That is why, uh, and I also feel it's very underused, but that is why I am uh, using it for, for Lucky 7 on Lucky 13. Uh, it started with, how can I make a game based around the D12? So, D12. And metal, clear plastic, what dice do you usually get? The purpose of a die is to roll on the table and give you a number. While metal has a nice look to it, it's a little evil to the table. If it falls off the die tray or something, it thunks a little too much. Clear plastic is a little too hard to read. Uh, any die where they put decorations around the numbers, they do that just to irritate me. <laughs> I want it plain, one color with a different color from the numbers. Black on yellow is a great high contrast thing, makes it easy to read from across the table. Red on black is what I used to like as a as a kid. Aesthetically, I still think that looks the best. But these days, uh, my eyes are a little older than they used to be. Black on yellow, plain plastic. What do you think about the electronic rollers? Anytime I want to learn a new programming language, <laughs> that's always the first thing I make. Because it's a good introduction to whatever language it is, right? Because you have to take the user input like for whatever they want to roll. And then you have to break that down. You know, you have to parse it, find the D, find the number before it, find the number after it, all that stuff. And you have to make the random numbers, combine them, do all that stuff. I usually do one where you can take the highest or the lowest die too when I'm doing those. So how do I feel about them? I would not use one at the table because there's something very visceral. Is that the right word? I don't know. Yes, that's about the right word. Physically holding this thing in your hand and making the action and putting it on the table that connects you, the player, with the action that you, the character, is doing. And I like that. And I think pushing a button on a phone or something takes away from that. For online play, there's no way around it. That is the best way to go. I tend to, if I didn't program it myself, I tend not to trust them, although I have no reason for that. That's just me being stupid. Now, ladies and gentlemen, have a good day, and hopefully we'll see you again. Uh, thanks for joining me, James. Everyone else, thanks for listening. Bye. Bye. You have been listening to the Decahedron RPG Podcast. Send email to feedback at decahedron.com. Remember to spell decahedron with a K. Voice feedback can be sent through the Anchor website or by calling 562-RPG-CAST. That's 562-774-2278. Links are in the show notes. Music is by Kevin McLeod and Alexander Nakarada. 
Logo is by Design Cat. Thanks for listening.